Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. It's great to see such a, a, a large crowd. Um, just a couple of uh, things uh, I wanted to say before introducing our speakers tonight. Um, firstly, uh, I wanted to notify you about um, an event that's occurring on Sunday evening, which is uh, a party, a Christmas party, at Santos Party House, which is something that um, artist space, white columns, light industry, participant, triple canopy, the kitchen, printed matter, we're forgetting one other organisation, have organised as a fundraiser for um, the kitchen, printed matter and primary information, who as you probably are aware were kind of um, uh, quite badly hit during Hurricane Sandy. So please do come along on Sunday night, it'll be fun. Um, and the next thing, uh, this is like some kind of end of the year fundraising announcement, but um, uh, I'd just like to kind of mention our artist space membership scheme you might not know about, which is uh, a great kind of way of supporting us as an organization. Um, it costs $50 for an individual membership for a year, $40 for artist membership, and with that you get free entry to all our events, um, so around 80 events that we do next year. Uh, discounts on the books in the bookstore and general love from artist space. Um, so uh, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about tonight, but um, tonight's event was obviously postponed uh, because of Hurricane Sandy, so we're really happy that David Yoslip and Pamela Lee were able to find a new date in their calendar uh, to join us uh, tonight. Um, the basis for bringing them together uh, is a recent publication of two new titles. Uh, David's After Art, published by Princeton University Press, and Pamela's Forgetting the Art World, published by MIT. Uh, I think it's kind of safe to say that, that um, both texts uh, stem slightly from uh, a dialogue between uh, Pamela and, and, and David um, that's kind of informed these, these publications. Uh, and in different ways, both publications uh, lay out positions around the nature of contemporary artwork as an agent within globalized networks. So uh, the idea really tonight to bring them together was to um, them to be in conversation, to draw out some of the central themes uh, in the two books uh, and to have a, have a general discussion about those, those concerns and also afterwards to open up into uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I know some of you have had the chance to read the books in advance, so it would be great to get people's feedback. <laughs> Maybe not so great. Um, so just to introduce Pamela and David more formally, before handing over to them. Pamela M. Lee is Professor of the History of Art at Stanford University. She has published two previous books, Object to be Destroyed, the work of Gordon Matter Clark, and Chronophobia on Time in the Arts in the 1960s. And she's also contributed articles to magazines and journals, including October, Grey Room, Art Forum, and Texas of Kunst. Uh, David Yoselit is Carnegie Professor of the History of Art at Yale University and an editor of October. His publications include Feedback, Television Against Democracy, and Infinite Regress, Marcel Duchamp, 1910-1941. Uh, he's a regular contributor to art periodicals such as Art Forum, Art in America, and October. So without further ado, I'll hand over to David Buchanan. years or so, 
And it's, um, I mean, it's a real privilege to be able to have this kind of conversation here with you this evening. So I'm going to begin um, with the introduction, uh, which is where one begins, I suppose, and just read a few pages, if to give you uh, a sense of the texture of, of my argument and uh, the kind of things, the kind of tropes within art criticism that this book wants to push against. So, I'm forgetting the art world. It's going now and fast. With a strange sense of purpose, or is it resignation, I have shelved the magazines and the announcement cards, given up on the galleries and their established and emerging artists. No longer can I retain the names, details, gossip around this new phenomena or that, this new current in theory or in art criticism, the fever dream around auctions, art fairs, biennials, MFA programs, the movement of curators, collectives, collectors, and dealers, the cultural emissaries du jour. I'm forgetting the art world because the art world, at least as it has been theorized for some 50 years now, is subject to conditions that may soon cease to sustain it. This is not to say that the art world is disappearing, diminishing in size, or slowing down its capacity to generate capital and hype. The opposite is the case. The art world, as it is generically understood, is both escalating and accelerating, appearing to turn so fast, always on the brink of its next obsolescence, that its maps can no longer be read as fixed or stable, its borders blurred at best. For this reason, forgetting the art world is not the same thing as ignoring or standing outside it, as if one could lay claim to a space beyond its imperial reach by wandering just far enough afield. I mean, nothing so naive as this outside or distance, the fabled Archimedean point from which to survey the workings of the art world as they take place down below. Instead, to forget the art world is to acknowledge that what made its activities, operations, and communities so distinct or memorable in the past, the kind of figure to a social ground upon which it was historically fixed and dialectically established, has now given way to a pervasive organization of its norms and procedures. When contemporary experience is ever rationalized through the logic of design, when the word creativity is taken as cognate to the market, and when social relations are relentlessly mediated by a formidable visual culture, the culture of the image writ large through the peregrinations of global media, the art world, as we once knew it, begins to lose its singularity and focus, to say little of its exclusivity. From Benjamin to Adorno, Debord to Jameson, we've been told of both the promise and the threat of this culture for a very long time indeed. This culture is such that whatever grasp we thought we had on the relative autonomy of works of art becomes increasingly tenuous, a condition exploited for reasons both progressive and reactionary. To update this by now familiar set of critical tropes, contemporary art has been increasingly recruited in the service of politics, economics, and civil society, a condition that George Yudise theorizes when he writes of culture as being an expedient resource to the increasingly managerial ethos of the global age. What this condition suggests for these present reflections, among many important things, is a certain eclipse of a historical notion of the art world. No doubt one forgets the art world because the competing logics of globalization, a word as banal as it is ugly, do not permit us to remember. The long-standing controversies around that term have everything to do with the current state of the art world and its forgetting. A typical shorthand of the topic describes a historical compression in time-space relations, the social acceleration of time and a virtual eclipse of distance, continuous with the liberalization of markets and the rise of the network society. Historians debate the periodization of the term, anthropologists' impact on indigenous cultures, activists haunt cities flush with capital or crowded with the poor, from Davos to Brussels, Porto Alegre to Bamako. Still, little consensus exists regarding globalization's consequences for the work of art, and still, the relay between contemporary art and globalization by far the most important curatorial rubric of the last two decades, 
remain stalled in something like a critical holding pattern. Provisionally, one might take a cue from the phrasing of Emanuel Wallerstein, who in a formative analysis of world systems theory described the period between 1945 and 1990 as the age of transition, a title that usefully captures a sense of the phenomenon's duration, restlessness, and motility. That globalization is an act, a process, or is happening, the ready to plan definition furnished by the OED, does indeed suggest a fitful relationship to category that curators, critics, and art historians alike have earmarked as a historical crisis. Whether or not this process is itself singular or directed to a unique objective, is a source of what thinkers from Arjuna Pottery to Ulrich Beck identify as globalization's principal questions, whether its motivations are univocal, or conversely, what is the reach of its differentiation on both economic and cultural grounds. This book takes as its project to interrupt, or to at least slow down, our view of such processes through charting what I call the work of art's world. Um, this is from the first uh, section of the book after the introduction um, and kind of sets up, uh, as in the passage that Pam read, um, sort of sets up the method or the direction of, of, um, of the text. The scale at which images proliferate and the speed with which they travel have never been greater. Under these conditions, images appear to be free, but they carry a price. Commenting to the New York Times on the 2010 rebound of Art Basel, the world's most prestigious modern and contemporary art fair, American collector Donald Rubel, and they're in the news today again, I, I see it, how to create a collection, useful information. Anyway, um, American collector Donald Rubel declared with no apparent irony, quote, people are now realizing that art is an international currency, unquote. The, <coughs> In a time of economic instability precipitated by worldwide financial failures since 2008, people now see art as an international currency. Art is a fungible hedge. Its value, at least the value of art sold at fairs like Art Basel in prestigious auction houses and at blue chip galleries throughout the world, must cross borders as easily as the dollar, the euro, the yen, and the RMB. By definition, a currency moves freely, though not without a price. It's an instrument invented to transfer value easily and efficiently, and now with the aid of computers, almost instantaneously. Even the negligible materiality of paper money has grown practically obsolete, required only for a fraction of transactions. Currencies are universal translators. They can assign a value to every kind of commodity, whether goods or services. In the 1990s, a second type of universal translator gained prominence, prominence, digital technologies, with the capacity to transpose any work in sound, image, or text into numerical sequences, into code. Contemporary art and architecture are produced at the intersection of these two universal translators, one that specifies value and the other that specifies form. But how can we describe the aesthetics of a currency like art? Our first task in assessing what kind of currency art might be or become is to understand the dynamics of its circulation, since by definition, currencies are constituted through exchange. At this moment, there are two dominant positions vis-a-vis -vis the circulation of art. Not coincidentally, they correspond to those that structure contemporary local politics. One is aligned to the world of Art Basel, as well as to the preponderance of large Western museums. It's a belief in the free or neoliberal circulation of images, where open markets render art, as well as other streams of images ranging from television to tweeting, as a form of currency. The second attitude might be described as fundamentalist. It posits that art and architecture are rooted to a specific place. Religious fundamentalism is defined by adherence to doctrine as laid down in sacred texts. Image fundamentalism asserts that a visual artifact belongs exclusively to a specific site, its place of origin. That, for instance, the Parthenon sculptures 
sold to the British Museum in 1816 by Thomas Bruce, 7th Earl of Elgin, who removed them from the Acropolis with dubious permission from the Ottoman Empire, should be returned to Bernard Schumi's state-of-the-art Acropolis Museum, which opened in 2008, especially to draw these works back to Athens unsuccessfully, as, as you know. It's worth pausing to assert that this great political conflict between neoliberalism and fundamentalisms that have emerged in both the developed and developing worlds, and which encompass most major religions, including Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and Hinduism, is not merely reflected in art, but advanced by it. Art has a diplomatic portfolio. It participates in building new public spheres and in opening export markets abroad. I'm going to stop there, and um, we'll start a discussion. <laughs> I think it's, um, it's likely that uh, you can already gain a sense of the overlap uh, between our, our two books and a uh, kind of Venn diagram of interests around questions about process, um, networks, uh, currency. Um, but we thought we would start very broadly, actually, uh, just by talking a little bit about what it means for an art historian, or how it means for an art historian, to even begin to tackle the subject of uh, globalization. How does one do it? Um, what are the models available that might not be adequate um, to our ways of thinking, and, and just methodologically, uh, how one goes about uh, taking on something which could threaten to overwhelm, frankly. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons that, um, well, this is coming in part from an email that we got in response to the first announcement of this, um, this evening. Um, from an artist friend of ours who will remain nameless who said, what's with forgetting and after? You know, should I give up now? And, um, and I think that the, the question of after, for me in the title, addresses this question of globalization because um, what I mean by after is um, not post, not that something's ended, but more along the lines of an after image in the sense of a, um, a reverberation a dissemination, but after image, the problem with that term is that it suggests a kind of loss of power, um, a sapping of, of um, uh, kind of color, let's say, or intensity of the image as it moves. But I, but one of the things I try to argue instead is that as images move, they actually gather force. Um, they create places and, um, and power, as opposed to um, the Benjaminian idea that as images are circulated, they actually lose their power or are drained of affect. And the other idea of after, uh, for me, has to do with um, how Sherry Levine, for instance, uses the term in her titles, after Walker Evans or after whomever else she's copying, in the sense that um, what art is, in some ways, is the, um, the instantiation of a genealogy. Um, people think about Levine's work, for instance, as more in terms of authorship and copying. I'd like to think of it more as she's creating her own, let's say, world um, yeah. of images. Um, if, if you don't mind my resuscitating one of the earlier titles for your book, um, it, it was at one point called States of Form, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Um, and I, I think this, this um, I don't want to say recuperation of the terms of formalism, but uh, something of the um, heuristic or um, proleptic um, character of form, the fact that form moves, that there's something after form, and that's the, the sequence of forms that the art world or the artwork undergoes through processes of digitization or being um, circulated um, along the interwebs is part of where you're going, yes? Right, I mean, and also that um, circulation is a form. I mean, and that's how partly I see your, um, your interest in the idea of a world, because it seems to me that that world-making is a, is a response to, let's say, the global sublime, the idea that, you know, nobody has a handle on what this thing called globalization is. I mean, what we mostly think of it 
as, I think it's an artifact of European art, Euro-American art, really. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. maybe you'll talk about the world a little bit as a yeah, form. Yeah, I'll talk about the world and I'll talk about forgetting, because uh, this, this uh, the joke, forgetting and after, it sounds so um, fatal. It sounds uh, just, you know, drop their hands and go, but um, I mean, I, I think, for me at least, and I'm sure for many of you, art historians or critics in the room, there comes a point when, after you've read the umpteenth biennial catalog, say, um, you, remain, you, you reach a, a certain frustration with, um, I mean, it's important the way that the art world has typically treated the problem of globalization in terms, precisely, of biennial culture. This is a very important way into the problem, but it's certainly not the only way. So to say that one forgets the art world is, on the one hand, to sort of uh, push that model aside as something that um, is a kind of process of endless self-reflexivity. What are we doing in the art world? You know, that's fine, and that's important and good. Um, but it's also, to get to this notion of world in, it's also to claim um, a much more formative uh, or agentic uh, status to the work of art itself as something that both contains a world, but also creates or recreates a world. And this is not, by any means, an especially, um, well, it's not a novel idea. The notion that a work of art is a world is, is something that I think we're all very familiar with. But uh, for me, at least, um, historically, it kind of comes out of earlier work that we've both done on the 1960s, where the kind of collapse, say, between the work of art's mediation within print media, and then progressively television, televisual media, and then finally the beginnings of the information age, um, are suggesting a very different notion of the world or an art world beyond uh, the institutions, the bricks and mortars of institutions of museums and galleries and, and whatnot. Um, so just a, a little bit of the backstory here is that uh, in a book that I wrote earlier called Chronophobia, um, there was a chapter called Study for an End of the World, uh, which was on the Swiss kinetic artist Jean Tangley. And what I was trying to argue in that chapter was the way in which his art was uh, very purposely confronting precisely the overlappings of televisual uh, media, uh, the work of art, um, and what was then the controversies around automation. So this is in some ways responding to that or at least bringing it up to the present. One of the ways that um, I tried to think about uh, the global um, in this book is to think about, it seems to me that, um, that often critics and art historians, maybe artists too, think about um, the work of art as a singular um, entity. And what I'm trying to do here by way of trying to understand forms of circulation is to think about um, how events can occur within populations of images. So instead of taking the, um, the kind of object of study as the singular thing, instead you think about um, how populations of images work and how folds or disruptions in those populations could occur. So um, for that reason, I've tried to use some architectural um, uh, motifs and traditions to think about how, for instance, uh, fields of space and data are interrupted and formed into um, um, configurations and volumes by various architects. Pam, too, in her book, uses um, interesting uh, digital and economic models, like the Bezier curve, which I'm fascinated by. Maybe you could explain this because, well, not explain it, but describe it. <laughs> Because it's, um, it's a model for scalar um, increases. Um, and, and I think one of the issues that globalization in, um, poses is how you deal with scales that are ungraspable, um, with expanses of events and, and locations that really um, can't be comprehended. It can't be comprehended and certainly can't be uh, narrated in any singular um, way any pretension to, to master the topic, you know, I mean, I, I think in the process of writing this book, uh, the question that
that was routinely asked as well, are you going to write about contemporary art from India? Are you going to write about Chinese art? So you, you know, this kind of um, the map making version, say, of globalization. And so um, for me, uh, to take seriously the idea of world process, to take seriously the notion that we tend to repress the idea of globalization itself as something that is happening, uh, was the way in to talk about um, just a few case studies, really, that, to my mind, are emblematic of any number of processes that we do associate with globalization and are con fully continuous with it. So this, um, this then becomes uh, a question of, of, of production, or maybe self-production would be the better way to describe it, as, as opposed to content and iconography which would be the other, um, I, I, I think, um, major approach to how um, art historians and critics and curators have, have dealt with this, this issue. Um, so, for instance, I'm sure you've read essays about images of airplanes and airports and um, borders and checkpoints and whatnot. And I don't mean to discount or disqualify any of those readings out of hand, but I think um, that gets at the surface level, say, of what the world process itself entails, what it produces. Uh, and this, to me, is very much in dialogue with your attitude towards content and the generation of content in, in your book. Yeah, yeah I mean, what I, what I argue, you know, from a kind of internet both metaphorical and actual point of view is that what more and more artists are doing is not inventing content but reframing it, reformatting it in basic ways um, through appropriation, through research projects, through um, various other forms of taking content and finding, um, fi making the aesthetic act the actual act of what I call the an epistemology of search, a form of knowledge that is based on uh, filtering on finding um, information from available sublime, you know, amounts of big data, let's say, in, in the aesthetic terms. Um, you know, what Pam was referring to before, like this idea, um, this almost impossible idea of a global project um, as encompassing the world or the world production of art, um, I think of this as the sort of meanwhile in China version. So, um, you know, you, you give a history of, let's say, here, and then you say, well, meanwhile, um, these pro projects were happening too. And it seems to me that the structure of globalization, I mean, you quote Wallerstein and others, but in the little passage that you read today, you know, globalization is, is a kind of division of labor that is globally outsourced. And so the question is, if we think about our own world, if we think about the production of art in that sense, how is our world globally outsourced? And there are a lot of ways, and you get into this too, um, in very specific ways. But in the little bit that I read, just to keep with what, you know, the sort of shared knowledge um, bank of the moment, I got very interested in these repatriation debates of the moment. Um, because it seems to me, of course, this isn't contemporary art, but it's a view of what art is as really belonging someplace um, at the same moment, dialectically, one could say, um, as we think of art as moving <coughs> with absolutely no barriers whatsoever to its circulation. And so I got very interested in this kind of example of a nativist um, attitude, let's say, toward works of art, though I found it very difficult to decide. For instance, I don't know what I, my opinion, luckily I don't really have to have one, about um, whether the, the Parthenon marbles should be returned to Greece or not. But it seems to me that the, the rise of these questions in our moment are coterminous with, um, with the kind of global circulation. You're very clear, though, that uh, as, as far as the nativist um, claims to works of art that some might call uh, ill-gotten booty, say, in the great museums of the West, that there's a radical disparity, clearly, between uh, where these works of art are held, after all, 
And um, I think that one of the phrases that, that I was very curious to know more about was something around the, um, the democratization, a call for the democratization of images. Um, I think as far as the literature on the internet is concerned, like many of us are probably familiar with um, well, Lessing work among many others but how do you see that in terms of the work of art itself beyond well, its sort of circulation as a virtual image say online right I mean if one thinks seriously about art as a form of value that is not merely a kind of um, aesthetic fancy value you know kind of um, transcendent value and one of the things I really believe is that art and our worlds, our economic engines. We've seen this happen in our own city of New York, but also, you know, ev not everywhere, but many places around the world. So I'd like to take seriously the fact that art is a value that includes full philosophical values, aesthetic values, but also real economic value in and of itself. It is an economic agent, not merely the victim, let's say, of commercial circulation but in fact a very important um, actor in such a world. And so um, if one takes this seriously, then the way that works of art are concentrated in the global north um, and stockpiled actually, um, and is a kind of inequity that we might think about. And also the way that art can lead to certain kinds of um, broadening of, of public spheres, which is um, happened in various parts of the world, including in China, where that seems to have been, you know, dialed back uh, this past year, but also um, in various post-colonial situations, that works of art might be distributed more freely than they currently are. It came out of a review that our one of our teachers, actually in graduate school, Irene Winter, did um, of um, Jim Kuno's book about uh, the Encyclopedic Museum, where she said. Um, she talked about an exchange between the Philadelphia Museum where they had gotten all kinds of great works of Indian art from India and the Indians wanted um, some works from the Philadelphia Museum and according to Winter, um, they were offered works of Indian art, which they didn't really need. Um, so they weren't offered, let's say, the, the Western canon. And, and, you know, in a way, it, even saying it, it feels a little far-fetched, but it also maybe isn't. That, you know, it's about a certain kind of value and tradition, and it's one of the ways in which globalization becomes a European issue. It, it seems that, that uh, if I might play devil's advocate, that uh, the immediate charge to this notion of um, art, art's diplomatic portfolio, I think that's the phrase you use, particularly in the case of, of China, is that, um, say you take the Chinese art market and uh, the rise or the proliferation of, of Chinese artists uh, who exhibit, say, in the galleries in New York, that the word aestheticization, the old valence that we ascribe to this term, would inevitably crop up as a way then of sort of papering over what are, uh, you know, uh, enormously uh, abusive, um, well, human, human rights right. uses, yes, and no. among any, many other things. So, how do you, um, how do you figure that into your account? Well, I've relied on this um, sociologist, uh, Richard Kirk Krauss, who argues that despite the problems of, um, of, let's say, the Chinese art market, that incremental openings and the kind of um, nascent civil society are established nonetheless. Now, this is very debatable, mm -hmm. clearly. But it does seem that art, like human, I mean, I've been interested recently in thinking about human rights as a model of the global, which it kind of is. It goes back to a form of universalism, which is kind of, you know, um, problematic in many ways. But, um, you know, if there is a standard and it's not met, is that standard still efficacious? You know, that's really the question. Mm -hmm. This makes me think a little bit of in your last full chapter when you talk about the collective and the problem, you call it the pseudo-collective. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe you could say something about that in terms of, you know, a lot of art made in recent years has really um, glorified, perhaps in romantic ways, um, 
claims of the collective and the political efficacy of the work of art. And it seems to me you have a kind of critical, though not condemnatory, um, yeah. reading on that. Yeah, um, to call a group like, say, the Rocks Media Collective, a pseudo-collective, is not to impugn them as being fake or less than or mendacious or whatever. It's to um, try to think about collective organization in ways that don't fall to um, conventional or traditional art historical principles <coughs> around representation and visibility. And so part of this notion of pseudo-collectivity has to do, um, or is continuous with, uh, the sort of politics of invisibility at this moment. Uh, what does it mean to be invisible? What does it mean to stake a claim outside of um, the politics of representation as such. Um, and this stems, at least in part, from uh, a term that I take from the Austrian economist, super uh, neocon faith, uh, named Ludwig von Mies, who talks about um, something called a consumer sovereign. Um, this notion of consumer sovereignty is, I argue, um, pretty much synonymous with how we think about the individual today within culture. So if we're going to then counterpoise this very contemporary notion of the individual subject, a consumer sovereign, against the collective, we have to imagine that the collective can no longer rely upon, as if it ever did, I, I want to clarify that, it's, I'm, I'm not trying to say that all collectives are the same, but that historically, a notion of collectivity would rely upon a certain claim to um, visual transparency, um, to um, um, visual transparency, a sort of uh, a motif, say, a representational motif that is in some capacity continuous now with the logic of the consumer sovereign. That to be an I, to be an I, to be the personal I that goes out and does things in the world, such as voting with your pocketbook, for instance, is precisely um, the terms against which I want to argue this, this notion of pseudo-collectivism um, is trying to, to argue. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I really think that the question of what's visible and what's invisible is, is very important, mm -hmm. because to go back to this kind of division of labor that globalization is, I think it's, you know, we all know that there are locally based art worlds that have no visibility beyond, you know, like 50 mile radius or whatever in the world. And so what exactly is the responsibility of someone like us claiming to think about global globalization in the context of art to that, you know, absolutely blatant fact, you know, that what we have access to has already, let's say, made it through several filters no, in order is, to circulate. Well, these are the, the artists in this book. They're, they would be considered mainstream. Right. Blue chip. Right. Super blue chip. Right. And that would be yet another charge, I think, that you can make about the art world that is being forgotten here, uh, right. is that it's not touching on those worlds that are invisible, that are very much um, working outside, say, the usual protocols of, of Monetize, right? but, um, yeah. Although there are local economies too that are very that's interesting. Right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder if maybe we should open um, the sun now. If people have questions, why not? Uh, well, what's interesting, if I may add to your uh, observation, is that this economy is actually of the art, even art, well, let's say China coming into the game, really mirror uh, the national economy in general, like when the Japanese economy was becoming big, the artists became big. When the Chinese became big, you know, the art became big. And, and you can, for example, see uh, even blue chip artists like Franz West, being from Austria, a smaller country that doesn't have a domestic art market, uh, fetches then in the end less value, uh, cost less, and let's say a German artist. Uh, just because simply of the fact that he comes out of this Austrian country. So the national economy in the back, that's why you see a lot of Swiss and Belgian artists. You know, so, 
and, and you don't see any African artists. I mean, you see our African artists as, as long as they can pass along as English or, or whatever, you know. Uh, or like they have some exceptions, you know, of people. But you see now Indian economy, so you see Indian arts. And you will soon see an African economy. And, and, and so that, like, that's also a very important aspect. But another, and, but one thing that you started to touch upon this uh, in, in the very end, and I think that's very important, there are many, 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 many ways of, of our worlds, if you want to call it, or our villages, if you want to call it. And, uh, and, and they do not necessarily all, you know, you know, function in the same soup, in the same exchange. You know, I mean, a lot of these problems, they apply to those artists who appear, let's say, even hers, you know, is on the front page, you know, today or yesterday, at least, on the internet side. And, and others, you know, never even make it into that paper or even other people of the status. So there are many, many words. But the, the, so uh, that's, that's it. And, uh, and the, the, the last question I want to say, with this is also related to the question of power. And critical power, and, and that's a question of power in the end. Also, like where are you looking at? You know, what institutions support you? Who do you support? I mean, like interesting. This question would be: Why do you write about? Or why? Why is the condition that you get this book published that most likely you have to write about the type of artists you wrote? Let's say if you would have written about artists that do not appear on auction houses. I'll, I'll say it would this very very quickly, and, and I, I appreciate very much. Uh, your first claim, which is that there were many, 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 many art worlds, absolutely. I wrote about the artists I wrote about. Um, in many ways, this is a book about the 1990s. Um, partially because each of these artists are considered major figures. They have a long reception history that allows me to do some um, digging. And uh, I simply, um, I mean, not in all cases, uh, there, there are artists such as Thomas Hirschhorn, who you know, many important art historians and critics have written just brilliant things about, but um, at least in the first two chapters on Murakami and Gursky, who are not my favorite artists, I felt that more needed to be said about them, and that's all, because they are considered measure artists, because they are functioning at that blue chip level. Um, why don't we talk about them and take them seriously on terms that they have not normally been considered? So, that's part of it. I wanted to sort of extend Rainer's question about the multiple art worlds, because it's something I was thinking as well. Um, I was, my question is really, I guess for both of you, but maybe more for Pam, that, um, you know, how you're representing the thing that's being forgotten, the art world, because I was struck by the singularity. And um, I don't mean um, as a counter to the singularity that there are many art worlds all over the world or whatever, which I think is true as well. But that even the, what we sometimes call, I don't know, the dominant art world or the Western art world, or whatever you want to call it, which is what I think you're talking about more, has always been itself multiple. Yes. That there are <coughs> discontents. Not only have there been you know, multiple art worlds within it, but it has its repressions which, which cause discontent. So if you could say something more about your representation of the art world. It is a bit of a rhetorical sleight of hand because it does get us into what would seem to be the overwhelming, overweening mainstream art world of a London and New York and Berlin. But what I go on to argue in the first in the introduction is that I'm really taking to task this notion of the art world as it's been elaborated by Arthur Dante many, many years ago as a space of both discursive and phenomenological separation, that the art world exists at some distance from the workings of the world down below in an almost Augustinian fashion. Um, and that my argument is that these realms are closing, that they are absolutely continuous. So when you talk about art and globalization, it's almost as if you're still subscribing to this notion that the art world is separate, when in fact we know that the art world is an engine of globalization. 
for me then to train my focus very tightly on works of art to think about their internal logics, the logics of their production and their reproduction and their circulation, in fact, is a way to show how, um, just how that is the case, that these worlds have in fact collapsed. Which is not to say that we ever believed fully in this myth of an art world that was held apart, but it does maintain in terms of uh, the kind of art critical language that says, well, museums in the West are now looking at, say, the art of uh, the Middle East or of, of Latin America or whatnot. That, to me, is completely inadequate. And I think um, many of us are probably very familiar with that sort of um, language within a certain genre of art criticism. So it gets you into the problem, but you're absolutely right that if I'm representing it in an almost monolithic fashion, there's a bit of a, a, bit of a heuristic thing that goes on there. Thank you. Um, I have a little bit of a phenomenological question, and I guess it's, um, I would ask David, because you talked about the gathering of force of images, which goes against the, uh, you know, sort of more received idea of the diminishing force of images through circulation and acceleration. Um, so I suppose then that, you know, the question or the subject then becomes how does an image gather a force? That is, how, how does the sequencing of distribution and dissemination actually produces a force which is even greater than the, uh, than, than, you know, the object itself. And then secondly, how should we start thinking about, you know, the very contours or the very materiality as, of the art object as an important um, aspect of the potential for the gathering of force? Do you mean how it re-enters the form of the work itself? Yeah, or is yeah. it important? Yeah. Is it important? But you can distinguish this from, let's say, music, right? right? Which a lot of people could agree has the potential to also diminish in through distribution and dissemination, and of course also at the level of the economics, right? right. So the economics of music are that nobody's making any money anymore, whereas in the art world, because of it, precisely it's the last thing that has object code and, right. and materiality, we can start producing a kind of economic force, right? I don't know, I mean, I'm just wondering if this is something you think about. Well, I'll give you two examples that are drawn from two very different worlds. One um, that I draw on the, in the book are two very um, interesting anthropologists, Jean and John Komaroff, who work on Africa. And they talk about how in some of the homelands um, in Southern Africa, formerly part of South Africa, um, the circulation and commodification of ethnicity actually becomes a kind of ground for economic development and therefore the kind of commodification of identity and even the falsification in some senses one could argue of a kind of ethnic, um, what they call an ethno-commodity actually is not necessarily A, a terrible thing and B, something that victimizes those of that ethnicity. They make a different kind of model where, in fact, creating this kind of, let's say, cultural product is a way of having, making some kind of viable economic platform. And we've seen this in various places around the world in terms of the development of museums. Then the other example, which is from the art world that um, maybe we're forgetting, is you know the Damien Hirst Global Show, um, where, in fact, saturation was the theme of that show. Now, apparently, it wasn't an economic success. But, um, but um, you know, it was a technique, a very obvious technique, where he took the form of market saturation and took it seriously um, as, a, as a tactic. Now, these are two, you know, completely different forms, but they're both about thinking about circulation as value and form. And in the book, I kind of try to, I oppose this perhaps too simplistically, um, I oppose aura a la Benjamin to buzz um, as that quality 
that is about a kind of um, multiplicity or saturation of attention around something. Now, you asked, how does, how does one fold this into a work of art? Well, I think the artists that I'm most interested in have found ways of doing this, I think, have found ways of building um, the logic of circulation into the object in some way or another. And I say that really vaguely on purpose because I think there are many ways of doing that. I think you can do it by making what looks like traditional sculpture, and I think you can do it by um, making what seems like a collective action or a pseudo, to use Pam's term, a pseudo collective action. So in fact, yes, I think that um, it's important, in my view, as a critic, let's say, to build the aesthetics of circulation in some way into one's objects. grand relationship, if I understand it correctly, between the artwork and you know, the place where it used to exist, I mean, no longer exists, or it's, it's erased. What happens to um, hermeneutics, or the kind of like interpretation or discursive practice that's possible in those smaller art worlds, um, or those invisible art worlds um, under this new regime? Well, what I would like to um, I mean, and I guess those strategies really do pertain largely to this art world <laughs> that we're kind of debating today. Um, what I put forth in the, the, um, the book as well is, um, well, I, I simply advocate for a logic of a format as opposed to a logic of medium. And to me, the format goes from the scale of the object to the scale of what Pam would call the world, um, to the scale of you know, global circulation of capital and images. And so, to me, a critical act is to format various kinds of histories together. So I don't think there's one way of doing this. I think that there are projects to be done and there are important um, um, messages to make by bringing together um, art worlds that are slow with art worlds that are fast or art worlds that are closer to their place of origin, with art worlds that are distributed. By the way, um, the museum's impulse towards stockpiling kind of creates a certain kind of, let's say, this is a horrible, ugly term, I'm going to regret having it fall out of my mouth, but a kind of encyclopedic nativism. You know, there is a kind of um, primitive accumulation when you think I mean, I've always wanted, and I've never done this yet, but I, I, I want to someday to really try to figure out what percentage of the holdings of great museums, just in the West, let's say, are in storage. And what really is that about when they're tax exempt, you know, and in order to, because they're a public good? And yet, they're not really. I mean, most of this work, and that goes back to Pam's question to me about the circulation of this of this stuff that's, you know, away, that's in storage. Of course, the Guggenheim has tried to monetize that, and, you know, I'm not going to condemn that entirely. Um, anyway, did I, not, did I get it, your question? <laughs> I talked around it, so maybe I'll give it off the hook. <laughs> Maybe you mentioned at the beginning uh, something about this uh, polarization between a neoliberal agenda and another type of world on the other hand that's yeah perhaps could be defined as a theocracy and so on. So there's a little bit of a, a binarism that's setting in the world in terms of politics. Um, and if we trace it back to an experience that we have in New York with gentrification, artists have unwillingly contributed to that process. Uh, so my question is, in relation to this neoliberalism, it is in this equivalence that we begin to establish in a mainstream way between neoliberal politics and the secular world, to present it in contradistinction to the theological world, which is a flattening 
of the diversity that exists in the second world. So my question is, is there a reflection in your thinking about those tensions that could exist in that distribution, or, or is this art be, is going to be complete, completely supplanted in that process of distribution? Um, no, what I would, you know, any argument arises out of the um, particular limited skills and archival knowledge of the person making the argument. So I use the materials that I've been practically able to gain access to. Um, what I would like to argue is that we think about circulation as an aesthetic object and that this be a question that is on the table for us. So I've made a certain kind of polemical opposition on purpose because I think one of the ways that a global world is <coughs> divided up is through this idea of a kind of neoliberalism versus a fundamentalism. So I'd like to think, well, if we think about this in terms of um, proximities and speeds of circulation, that the fundamentalist is about um, an art that remains rooted to a place versus a kind of art that is in motion. Um, that this is a way of opening out these um, questions of the different worlds, the different kinds of circulation. Because these are different worlds. I mean, the Peruvian artifacts that were returned from my own university, Yale, um, you know, don't usually, aren't usually talked about with, let's say, Murakami. But they belong to the same logic of valuing works of art. So I have not exhausted this subject by any means. And I haven't in, um, uh, encompassed it um, in, a, in a final way. But what I've tried to do in this short polemical book is to say, let's think about it in these ways. Let's, in fact, think about what, that, what those circulations might mean and how they create different kinds of um, aesthetic uh, results or products. David, Pamela, is David's conception of circulation as an aesthetic object compatible with Pamela's idea of the work of art as an elemental unit of analysis? Oh, Chris. I'm not, sure. I'm, not, I'm, not sure that's, I'm not sure that's Pam's argument. I don't it's, think that's... Um, yeah. Her, I mean, I'm not going to speak for you, but I would just say that um, in my mind, as I read it, the object of analysis is a world. The world is a, of art is a crystallization. crystallization. Thank you. Yeah. It's a crystallization. <laughs> Truly, we did it reverse this. <laughs> we did it. We did it. We did it. No, no. And uh, the work of art becomes then an agent, as a, a, an occasion for these various processes, which would include, of course, circulation as maybe the ground for that world. I mean, you could say that the work of art slows circulation down, that it kind of freezes it, let's say. I mean, to go back to these crystalline metaphors, that. Um, that when circulation is slowed down to the point where you can see it, instead of Pam in one of her chapters has this amazing recuperation of the term ether, which I guess has a whole history, recent history, which I personally was unaware of, but it's kind of fascinating, you know, that, that imagining this world of things in motion as ether, but maybe the ether gets frozen into an object in some way. And um, that's, you know, one of the hardest things, it seems to me, about thinking about art is how you think about what's inside the work and what's outside the work and how you make a responsible account of that meeting. It's, to me, it's extremely hard. And I think that a world, for instance, is a formation of all of the ether, let's say. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to send you out on the book tour. Thank you. <laughs> David, in your opposition between images over circulating digitally and belonging to the neoliberal world and the nativist 
or local or site specific. Um, where, what is the place of discourse? Because ultimately, the place where an artwork arrives is that of a discourse. Where it attaches and attaches to it, such as yours or Pamela's, some discourse which also circulate at a price and at a speed are more quote unquote universal, some are less universal. But discourse is the place of the artwork, more so that whether it's in the Parliament or at the British Museum. Um, I do we deal with, with that, the question of the idea, which is inherently material. Um, I would think, I mean, in my view, the place of discourse um, or discourse is connectivity. It's, um, it's the pattern of connections that are made between these things. Um, so it's a kind of, I mean, I try to develop this idea of a kind of epistemology or one could perhaps say an aesthetics of search. And what search does is filter information into a form that can be consumed. And I think that discourse in the art world does that. I think what maybe both of us are interested in trying to do is to kind of um, make different connections, you know, kind of like a Nam June Paik piece, which is, um, you know, a, a little bit of a DIY engineering, which a uh, kind of um, Frankenstein effect, perhaps, but um, to, um, cross the wires a little bit of discourse. I think of discourse as connection. So I don't think there's any contradiction, personally. I, mean, I, I think place is a contradiction. Place it? I didn't place the question as a contradiction. Oh, okay. Well, the place of it, because you did talk about place, I think the place, the site, the location is the point of enunciation. And then um, it, it circulates like anything else, and therefore um, its second site is the site of circulation. Experts. 
and they hold value, but they also can lose value, and they, they move money around, and they keep currency in one place, or they don't. Um, and so your technological metaphors that you have been using, I mean, the, the internet can be used by everyone. Of course, you know, it's not, but that's sort of the great promise. Uh, whereas you know, something like, again, a speculative instrument cannot. That's for the realm of experts or professionals or something else. So anyway, I sort of wonder, uh, is there a sense in which you conflate the two? conception of, of movement of the image, or do you think that in, you know, or maybe these aren't binary opposites, or maybe there's something about good currency in art that sort of does one thing and Yeah. Let me try to clarify how we're using it, whether it will satisfy or not is up to all of you. But um, you know, as you remember I start with um, a claim by one of the most prominent American collectors that are in fact functions as a monetized currency. He's not really speaking metaphorically, as far as I can see. And in fact, the lack of a metaphorical valence in that context is accurate, because I've heard from many dealers that, you know, in the course of this crisis, you know, there hasn't been really a crisis in the art world. Maybe I'm wrong, but I've heard from many who are in a position to know that capital is moving into the art world. That's not to say that every artist who deserves support is getting it, as we all know. But what I say in the text, um, and what I mean very precisely, is that both currency and digital reformatting are um, uh, um, techniques of translation of value. So I would say, yes, that the work of art is a site where value is translated. Um, and that tra translation can be completely monetized, or it can be um, entirely about a kind of act of, of knowledge or enlightenment. Um, and so I'm trying to use the term in a way where it can migrate in terms of scale and type of value. It purposely is meant to, to shift in those ways. Um, I was actually, because maybe this follows the question that just was posed, but the metaphor of connectivity, this course is connectivity and buzz, you know, to follow um, aura, made me sort of wonder about the place of antagonism in, in, your, in this metaphor, because I am so aware that there's no don't like on the internet. Right. You know, so, I mean, I feel like it's, it troubles me that there's so little, you know, where does, where does hatred, antagonism, um, wanting to make a break, where does all that fit into this general metaphor that you're using, like, like, like? Um, I have to be, I guess, honest and say that the conditions that I was interested in trying to think about um, have to do with um, the neutralization of those kinds of um, positions uh, with great efficiency. And so, in a way, I mean, to put it as a postage stamp slogan, I'm interested in how art can be progressive without posing as critique. And so, to me, what can happen is that in those realms of lots of like, that there can be kind of, um, that there can be certain kinds of events and crises that are not affirmative of cultural norms, but that they have to kind of live in a world of what you're calling all like, because I do think that um, in order to circulate widely, a work has to enter into some realm where um, its total nihilistic hatred, let's say, um, has to be made consumable, at least to some. Now, we could argue about that, maybe we will, but, um, but that's, that was the kind of critical problem I was trying to think about. Like, if you can't critique the system, does that mean that the work of art is completely complicit? I don't think so. Um, 
And I was trying to understand, to think about, to imagine ways in which that those kinds of progressive events could happen in art without um, a kind of withdrawal of critique. Uh, I just want to also say something about the currency thing. The currency, you know, that if we talk about money, is mass produced and has in itself no value, but generates a value through uh, exchange. And, uh, and that can stop immediately, let's say, when there's a switch from the Deutsche Mark to the Euro or so, it has, or from the Euro back into the Drachen or something. You know, you can switch, then, yeah, so you can store the drug. But, you know, things can change. Uh, the, uh, so it's a medium that is transitory. It has a name. An artwork is not mass-produced, and, uh, and, uh, and it doesn't, and if, if it becomes a medium of exchange, if it changes hands a lot, you know, if it enters blue chip circuits, it can be handed around, it does fulfill that function, and we know it, for example, at the end, uh, Catalan didn't own any of the pieces that made that much money. You know, he, he was out of the game uh, at about, uh, you know, a couple of thousand dollars, the early pieces, the most expensive ones, you know. So, but what happens is, if that also exchanges, you know, let's say, if they, you know, I mean, very seriously, there is no end to it. Except, you see, and then even if it is becomes suddenly, if it drops out, let's say it's forgotten, it, Nobody wants to pay anything. Like the market drops, and, and nobody wants it. It still is an art, you know. And with the money, it, it doesn't have. Right. I mean, that's why, you know, my fantasy goal would be to think of a critical category that could embrace those two diverse forms of value together, as opposed to saying, "I made a work of art, then it went into a market." and this, these things happen to it. I'd like to imagine that those two, that there's not a kind of um, break between those two moments. I think maybe that's a good moment to create some close. So thank you very much.